emphasize the power of having your students have a composition book or notebook. You can use spiral notebooks too, and they're, again, 50 cents each at these dollar stores. Get your permission from your administrator to buy them, he'll reimburse you. Just give them their seats to the secretary, you'll get a check in a month. It is so useful for your students. It helps them be accountable, helps, help them, helps them be organized, helps you help them stay on the ball. They're not scrambling for, they ran out of paper. It's one thing to lose a pencil. You got, I gave you a tool, a couple ways, we know a couple ways of solving that problem. This is a harder one. Now, what happens when he loses his composition book? You gotta have a policy. Do you have spare paper and say, write in this, get yourself a new one? Do you have extra ones that you charge them for, which you could do? If they cost 50 cents each, you could charge them a dollar, so you can have another one for a dollar, you know, something like that. There's got to be some accountability system. You know, I have another one, but it's going to cost you a dollar. I prefer this because then you have this gigantic thing on their desk. It's too much. I want, these desks are pretty small. I want a little thing here. I want to be able to go outside and do an activity with this. I don't want to have to have this, you know, I don't, pages don't come out of here and get lost, you know. Good point. Good point. That's one possibility. The other possibility, instead of using a small composition notebook, use a spiral notebook for the same purpose. And a little, da little piece of tape, a little dab of Elmer's glue, puts that handout right in there and stays in there. You know? That's why I gave you a whole bottle of glue. You know, all it did is take one drop of glue, a couple drops of glue, and the next day it'll be permanently glued in there. You know, you can do that with, I've done that with this too. I've either had half-sized worksheets or worksheets that I fold in half, I tell them fold in half and we'll glue it in there. You know, I do, I, I think worksheets are great. You know, I think they're really helpful and very useful. But, um, so try different systems that will work. But I don't like them having a giant binder on their desk. I just find that's cumbersome and it, their desks aren't big enough for that. You know, in my opinion. Yeah, I'd rather have them nothing on the desk, just a worksheet, and then, yeah, and then put it in. Have both. I mean, if you use spiral notebooks that are, already have the pre-punched holes, they can keep that in there and just pull it out for you. That's one option. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the size. If that works better for you to have a bigger size, but a dedicated binder or notebook that they can take out and just have that on their desk is so useful. And some students prefer that because they don't want to carry this whole big thing around if they have something small that helps them too. Very important. So, oops, I just lost my image. Computer went to sleep. Uh, this image here is what? What are you looking at? Yeah, it looks like a garden. That's okay. This is what I have a friend who is a getting his PhD in a laser laser optics in uh, Jerusalem at the Hebrew University. And he sent me these two images. Um, let me just short, shrink this guy down. I'll close it. There we go. And that's, that's before. And this is what that image looks like to someone who has had laser damage to his eyes because a laser was shined in his eye. That's the same image will look like to that person. And just emphasizing since I'm giving out lasers, I thought, okay, again, these are low wattage lasers and won't do that, but be very careful, you know, in terms of the green lasers. Don't ever let them into your family, into your class. You know, the green, you know when they sell a laser, it has a key to, to turn it on. You know that you've got to be careful of that. Even the, one, even the cheap ones from China have a key on them. There's something, you know, they, can, they sell them for like $15 now. They used to be $1,000. When I was in, in high school, I remember my, te my physics teacher had a, one of these lasers that were, you know, even $15. It's crazy, you know, so they're, they're dangerous. All right, that's enough of that. Uh, today, this afternoon, our, we have four topics according to our outline. Um, writing lesson plans, why and how, 
principles of visual instruction, principles of hand-on engagement, and principles of differentiated instruction. So that's a lot to cover, but I think we can do it. So maybe I can ask you what your... Uh, this is off the record. Well, it's on camera, but you're not on camera. What is your... If you, if you have taught before, what is your personal experience with lesson planning, writing lesson plans, not writing lesson plans, pros, cons, difficulties, challenges, any uh, thoughts to share uh, about your experience with lesson plans? Do you think they're a waste of time? Do you think that they're too hard to do or you don't really understand what it means? Just, I'm just, well, well, see. Yes, I've, I've, never, I've never done this. I mean, they require it. Uh, I guess it's good because it's all teaching. Yeah. I hear that. So you start off by saying they're all good. What do you mean, what do you mean by that? Alan, you want to chime in? Uh, I find that with uh, presenting things in science, I don't think it's a chance. Uh, I find that I can find it along, I find it along in front of 30 kids. So I, everything I'm going to show them, I do ahead of time, I problem by problem, problem ahead of time, and write them all out. And I even lab, I um, share a work every time I try to lay I'm going to respond to everything you're all saying with the following. My goal for this next 40 minutes is that you should, uh, and you should, I should inspire you to want to have a lesson plan for every lesson, but not necessarily the way you think of a lesson plan. And I, 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 maybe what stops you or, you know, I'm not saying that what you do on note cards is not a lesson plan. I, I want to define it in a certain way and explain to you why I think it's really important to have a lesson plan every single day, even if it's not necessarily the formal form that you were taught you know, to do, although it may be. The, the purpose of a lesson plan is 
to, so I, uh, my only goal is I want my students to achieve this objective. How, and I should have rewritten this for this afternoon because this is a different objective. But let's say I'm going to choose one from your curriculum that is um, uh, explain the pros and cons of Columbus's discoveries. That's pretty big for one lesson, but I'll keep it for now, okay? Or, here's one, one of my favorite ones to write. Explain the Of, uh, of, of, of the law of gravity. What's, what are you wondering? Students love it, you know? What does it stand for? What, who, when, where, why, and how? I use this a lot. Once they did it once, they know it. But it's a shorthand for, I want you, at the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain the what, who, the what, where, when, why, who, and how of this topic. Okay? That means, explain means, or whatever it is, pros and cons, uh, compare and contrast. I, I taught uh, uh, many times about the Three Gorges Dam in China, the biggest uh, hydroelectric project in the world. It's incredible, 22 megawatts or something like that. And there's enormous benefits and some enormous costs, environmental costs of it. It's not a black and white issue. There's pros and cons. And so we, and I want my students to be able to, you know, be able to say over what those pros and cons are and, and make, form an intelligent opinion about it. And there's no right or wrong answer as long as you can say both sides of the argument and then make an opinion. So, question. Like this one right here, or this one. Take your objective. What do your students need to do? Listen to my verbiage. What do our students need to do to accomplish this objective? If I asked them all to do it right now, could they do it? No. They haven't done it. They don't know anything about Columbus discoveries. They don't know anything about the law of gravity. So what are they going to have to do in order to be able to accomplish this, and how will I know they accomplished it? So if I have them, let's say I have a, um, I'm going to take this image off the screen, really just to give me a whiteboard. Let's say I have, I'll draw a timeline here, okay? You might want to put this in your notes just for thinking, okay? Here's zero, and here's 45. That's the period of time of your class today, 45 minutes. 45 minutes after the first bell, there's going to be another bell, and around that time, you're going to dismiss the class. So somehow, in that trajectory of time, I want not only for my students to accomplish this, I want to be able to know that they accomplished it. It's a lot to do in 45 minutes. What's going to have to happen? So first and foremost, I, we all know I have to have a chunk of time that's going to have to be some kind of a warm up, right? Get them settled, and it's going to have to be some chunk of time that's going to be an engagement, what we call motivation. That's when I get them into the lesson, get them caring about it. Some chunk of time has to do. It has to happen. If I don't give them a warm up, they don't get settled. If I don't, and I don't take role. If I don't give them motivation, then they're not into it. So I have to have those things happen, even if they take one minute, five minutes, I don't know, but it has to happen. And if I don't plan in advance, it may not happen. It may, I might get lucky, 
I make, you know, on this, you know, I have an Einfall, as they say in Yiddish, uh, an idea come into my head, like, oh, I know what I'll do for the, yeah, but maybe not. And maybe if I've taught it a few years in a row, I'll get better at coming up with things on, on the spot, but better if I thought about it in advance. Okay, that's the beginning. At the end, there's going to be some chunk of time for assessment. For me to find out what, how, to what level they achieved this goal, and not only for me to find out, for them to find out. Because if, you, if we do our job well, if I can save time here, make sure I've blocked off time to have a, an assessment of some sort, and they can see that they've learned something, how do you think they, that affects their feeling about class today? One guess. They love it. They feel successful. They learn something. You know the old adage, the old uh, saying about a southern, this preacher? They could probably say it about a Rav too. I know they, but they say it about a preacher. This preacher is a very successful preacher. People love this preacher. You go around town to town preaching. So someone asked him, what's your secret? You know what his answer was? He said, he's a southern preacher, so he sort of, he sort of spoke with a you know, southern accent. I don't know if it was, I, I just, this is what I do. I tells them what I was going to tell them. Then I tells them. Then I tells them I just told them. You get it? Three times. You start off telling the students, here's what we're going to do today. And then they do that thing. And then you end off by showing them that they learned something today. We go back to the objective. So you leave the objective on the board all the time. And you constantly return. Even during the lesson, you might, while they're working on the other product, you might f stop traffic and... Or you might say, well, what is today's objective? Are we getting there? Okay, And you might have to go back to it. But at the end, that may or may not happen, but this must happen. At the end of the lesson, time to, for them to see and for us to point out that they learned, they achieved today's lesson. And here's how I recommend it. I recommend that this assessment chunk off minimum of the last 10 minutes of the period. Minimum, maybe 15 minutes, judging on the size of your class, your students, and so on. What that means, I would even recommend you err on the side of more time than too little. You don't want to rush it. This is vital to the success of the lesson. I would say 15 minutes are dedicated. That means at 15 minutes before the end of the period, you stop, you've, you've had to plan it this way, that you stop and say, we're going to do an assessment now. The assessment may be a number of things. Uh, if, in this objective, it may be uh, a question. Explain the pros and cons of Columbus's discoveries. <laughs> and they have to write a paragraph. And while they're writing that paragraph, you're walking around and you're checking, hey, how did you do? And are they doing it? And you're checking them off that they're doing it. And then the last five minutes, after they had 10 minutes of writing, you're having them share their answers. They're not all going to share. You don't have time. You have a few of them share their answers. And 30 seconds or 20 seconds before the bell rings, you say, guys, today our objective was explain the pros and cons of Columbus discoveries. I was amazed. I went around just now. We had some people share their answers. You all achieved today's objective. You did a great job. Have a great day. Bing, the bell rings. I've timed it so that I finish. The bell rings. I say, have a great day, and they're gone. That's a perfect lesson, okay, where you've timed it that way. And you can only do that if you've planned it in advance some, to some extent. Now, do you notice how I said, have a great day? I love that as a, when you're training them the first day about the routine. Class is dismissed when you hear the following words from your, your dear teacher. Have a great day. If you don't hear those words from me, you're not dismissed. It's a great, or come up with some phrase. If you don't like my phrase, come up with some, right? Or make it a great day, whatever you want to say. Give them a phrase like that. They know until they hear those magic words, they're not dismissed. So then if you wrap every list, they should be able to walk in the hall and the teacher says, you should, I should be able to tell Rabbi Majeski, if he's your principal, or Rabbi Sendro, or Rabbi Feigenbaum, I should be able to say to him, ask 
I want you to ask Dr. Eidenson's students in the hallway what they learned today. And any one of them should be able to tell what they learned. If you don't review the objective at the end of the class, they'll forget. <laughs> they'll, but if you review it right before the bell and praise them for somewhat getting it or really getting it, whatever level they got it, sometimes I, here's what happens. You know, guys, I feel like we got this half today. What do you think? Not whole. Maybe we're going to have to do it some more tomorrow. You guys did a great job. Have a great day. And then tomorrow we continue because we didn't get through the whole thing because my timing was off or whatever. This got up or got this distraction. doesn't matter. But I still reviewed it with them for the last couple minutes and I praised them for whatever level they did achieve. They feel good about it. They feel, they feel successful that they learned something and they're going to come back the next day motivated more because they feel like I'm learning something in this classroom. Learning is the best motivator. Better than any other reward you can give them when they feel like they're learning something. And when, you're orga when we are organized and we save time for that assessment and that recap, it really makes a difference. So now, how much time are we left with? This was, let's say, in an ideal world, the warm-up is like three minutes. That includes, that includes like asking them to share their answers. Okay, let's, let's be a little realistic. It'll be five minutes. The motivation, you know, doesn't have to be more than a couple minutes, but realistic, let's make it even five minutes. Okay, so now we're 10 and 15, that's 25. How much time is left for the actual learning? 20 minutes. That's all they have. <laughs> so we try to minimize this. Try to shrink this down a little bit here. And maybe shrink this a little bit. But you're only talking about 20, 25 minutes of actual doing whatever it is they have to do to achieve this objective. So now I have to think. What can my students do in 20 minutes that will achieve this objective? Hmm. Maybe I better make this objective a little less ambitious. Maybe we'll just focus on one aspect of the discoveries. Maybe today and tomorrow a different aspect. Maybe, you know, you know just make it smaller, err on the side of uh, too little, actually, than too much. Because you, you want them to feel they accomplished something. If you make it too much, then they feel frustrated. We, can't, we never finish our objective. It will bother them. So better to have too little to do and uh, stretch, out the, stretch this out, the discussion, the sharing a little bit more. Okay? How do you get the, by the way, the way to get the timing down is you spend 30 bucks on Amazon and you get one of these. A fisherman's, what they call it hunting wristwatch. Okay? Five vibrating alarms. You have it vibrate at that moment, 15 minutes. Right? So you, they don't know. You just feel it. They're not going to know. Oh, it's time for me to do the assessment. Right? It will remind you. Right? And you can have it vibrate again one minute before the bell so that you never, almost never go over the bell. You make that a very rare occasion when you have to keep them longer than the bell. You want to wrap up right before the bell. And they'll love you for it, that you're on time, as most of the time. That's okay. In the case of time, you have to go over a, a few seconds. It won't bother them so much. Uh, this is this is made by Cass, Casio, and uh, there's other versions. This is the one I found was the, both a combination of inexpensive and uh, ha I wanted five vibrating alarms. So I was teaching multiple periods, and I needed to for that to work. I have links to it. I can email it to you if you want uh, from Amazon. This is already a year ago or two years ago, so I don't know if they're still valid. So what can I? How do I plan those 20 minutes? that's going to be meaningful, I want those 20 minutes to be them doing something. What are they going to be doing? To, well, that depends on what you're teaching them. Is it doing problems? Is it writing a, reading something? Something they should be doing. So, that had to be, yeah, so do what Dr. Eidenson does, okay? Think through, even do it yourself. Until you've done it a hundred times, even then, like, if you're a math teacher or if you're English, whatever your history, like, look at what you ask them to do and think. Try to see it from their perspective. If I was a 10th grader and I'm supposed to explain pros and cons of Columbus discoveries, what do I, should I do? Do I need to study this chart, watch a video, whatever? It, what do my students have to experience or do? History is a, a big challenge in this way. It's a lot easier to teach over sciences or maths or things where there's much more objective, you know, much more easier to, nug to make nuggets, to chunk it. But it, history may require um, a combination of you writing and them writing, 
the goal is, as I told you earlier, is to you to get them doing as much as possible. And I want to talk a little bit later about using textbooks. Maybe that's on tomorrow's schedule. Yeah, that's for tomorrow's schedule. But whatever tools you use, plan it out. And no, it's not. Yes, it's not going to be perfect. But that's the value of a lesson plan. So the formal lesson plan that is given over by the experts. I'll put I put one in your in your notebook, and I'll put it on the board here. Um, I put the this is a template, and I'll explain to you the wisdom behind it. Whether or not you choose to use it, it's your call, but at least you should understand the wisdom behind it. Um, so we have here, is that showing up on the video okay? Is the audio coming up okay? Okay. So the idea of this is that if you, if you write it this way one time, and you will hopefully continue teaching next year, you pull this out of your notebook and you've got a lesson and maybe you tweak it a little bit but you build a repertoire and it's a lot easier. You're, the first time around it's a lot more work and then it becomes easier and easier as time goes on. Unit of study, this is just to keep it organized. Unit of study, you know, is, you know, um, uh, motion if it's physics or fractions or whatever, right? Core learning goal divide by fractions. Some of assessments simply means, this is a formal language, it means on the final exam what questions are going to test this. You know, you know, questions four, five, and six on the final or something. This is just a way of planning. That way you know that, okay, objective, that's this. What's the real objective? What's today's objective? What do I want them to learn today? Um, what vocabulary is new for this? Uh, the lesson and what materials might we need that are not standard materials. Now vocabulary I didn't talk about before but it's a good time to talk about it. Is there any subject that does not have new vocabulary to learn? Can you think of one? Maybe, maybe sign language? <laughs> I mean even that, <laughs> right? Every subject has vocabulary. Math does, right? So I recommend, I like my students to have, I do is I tell them to do it in the back of their notebook. I flip it over, it's just a running vocab list. It helps them, it's just an additional tool. Rather than put vocab randomly at every, once in a while there's vocab, which they could do also and highlight, that's one strategy. Another is to have a vocab list and I'll let them know. I might come up with on the spot, <laughs> like suddenly it came up in a discussion, I'll say, no, that's a good vocabulary, let's add that to our list. And I'll put it on my notes, and I'll put it on the board. Like, for example, this came up once when I was teaching environmental science. And I thought, that's a great vocab term. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on the board. You're going to put it in your notebook. And I'm going to hold you accountable for it on the next quiz, the open note quiz. Anybody know what NIMBY stands for? Yeah, what's the relevance of it? Power plant, water tower, some ugly infrastructure thing. When you want it, everybody wants a water tower, nobody wants it in their backyard. So where, how are we going to deal with that? So then I show them pictures of like colorfully painted ones, things that, that attempts to make water towers more attractive, right? And this, they love it, right? It's not in a textbook. I came up with on a spot, it was in a discussion of the classroom, and I decided we'll make a vocab term, and they put on the vocab list, and I put on the next quiz, and it was a word they all learned. And I had parents telling me that, you know, they had kids talking about NIMBY at the Shabbos table. You know, it, it, they learned it, okay? If it's a meaningful word and they get it, they're into it. So I recommend a vocab. But generally speaking, it's good to practice, to, to plan in advance which vocab might come up. And for some learners, oh, did I say some learners? All learners, you've got to put it on the board. Remember my rule, if it's not on the board, they don't hear you? So what some teachers do is in addition to this basic information that's always on the board, if there's vocab, they'll just they'll put it there in advance. Today's new vocab. Okay. How is a student supposed to get a definition of a vocab? Hopefully it's in the back of the book. Make sure you let them know that if you if you want to, if you dis if you feel like the, the book's definition is not 
good enough for you, you want to tweak it, you have the right to tell them that. But you have to tell them that. If you don't tell them that, then they should be able to use the book's definition. If you want to change the definition because you think the book's definition is inadequate, and that can happen, then just let them know that. Otherwise, you have to let them use the book's definition. Okay, so that's all the planning. That's not the actual lesson. That's just the background. So the, this is on. So then, well, what drill? Drill means warm up. What's their warm up that I want them to do today? I don't know if you need that much space, but um, this, the idea behind this is just to help our planning. This is not meant to be, you know. Uh, you're not getting graded on this, but you are in a sense, because the, the effectiveness of your lesson will reflect this. This space right here, see this little line there? That's for you to put the amount of time you think it's going to take to do that. Well, I hope that your drill or warm-up or bell work will be approximately the same amount of time every day, three minutes, maybe something like that. But you still need that if you want to achieve this goal that I, to I took it off, the goal of ending on time with a proper wrap-up. So it's important to put in there just quick planning. Assessment drill, that's just, you know, show of hands. What are you going to do to see if they did the drill? Show of hands, visual. It's just for you. It's for you to think about it. This, this is, you can skip this if it's the same every day. Transition. How am I going to transition to the motivation? Well, this is a little bit too pedantic for most teachers. They don't want to have to like, write out a transition. But it should help you think about it. Once you get more, once we get more and more experience, we don't need to plan that much. But this does matter a lot. What's going to be the hook for this? Personal connection. What's going to help your students want to learn this topic? Okay. Raise your hand if you've heard of 1492, right? What happened in 1492? Right. Anything else happen? Yeah. Half a million Jews were told to leave Spain. What's the relationship between that expulsion and Columbus? Columbus was set to sail on the same day that the Jews were kicked out, the ninth of Av. He couldn't leave because the port of Barcelona was so crowded with boats of Jews leaving, he had to delay his voyage by a day. That's a fact. Did I hook you? I hooked you, didn't you? Didn't I? I just hooked you through a little story. Or I might hold up a picture of, a, of, of the Santa Maria and tell you, see that, that, that uh, crow's nest up there? That, that, the, 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 the little deck way up high? The person up there was the first one to spot land because he was the highest up. That was a Jewish guy. We know his name. He was on Columbus's ship. The first... European to discover America was a Jew on top of Columbus of Santa Maria. That's a fact. So, oh, I just hooked you. Now you're kind of interested. Wow, there's a personal connection. There's a Jewish connection. And you can all, any personal connection you give, personal story. Let me tell you about the story time I sailed. I was on a sailing ship. Now that might take longer than I want, but it connects them. It hooks them in. Like I was on, a, anyone here ever been on a sailboat? I was, and I got so sick, you know. I could tell you the personal story. Anything you can do that makes it relevant to them, that's your motivation. Think about it in advance. The timing helps, but that's less important than just thinking, how am I going to make this, I've got it, I'm a, my job, my boss told me I have to teach them this. How am I going to make it relevant to them today? Find something. I, I gave the example of uh, show and tell things. You know, that can be a hook. Whatever it is, plan it out. And then, this is the 20 minutes. This is, forget about this words here. This is what they're going to do during those 20, 20 or 25 minutes of actual engagement with something to achieve the objective. That's what you have to figure out. What are they going to do? Is it a worksheet? Is it a puzzle they have to solve as a group? Is it reading a passage? You know, what is it, or a combination of thereof? Is it a set of math problems? Is it you know, me chunking a bunch of little lessons that I'm going to go back and forth with them, a little discussion? Is it a video? All kinds of things. That's all here. That's just you're thinking about it. What worked last year? What didn't work last year? 
what could work this year? That's the art of teaching, is coming up with these, and, and you, sometimes you're more successful than others. But that's the idea of the plan, is just to think about it, and then save it for next year. And then, this is where you, I just talked about before, and I had the timeline there, that's the last, this is the last, this is the, you know, of the last 15 minutes, this is like 10 of those. You having them show what they learned in some way, hopefully in some kind of writing piece. And I use, the, I recommend the following, whether you do it as a worksheet or on the, I recommend the notebook. I always call it, this is a little light color for this, try blue. I always call it exit pass, meaning this is what you have to do to get out of my classroom today, okay? Um, um, uh, mo uh, velocity um, a, is a car turning right at a constant speed of 25 miles per oops miles per hour also at a constant velocity justify your answer I recommend you write this down as a sample. This is a fantastic assessment format. A yes or no question followed by the, by the statement, justify your answer. You can use this in almost any subject you're teaching. Is, um, are, are equivalent fractions proportional? Justify your answer. It forces them to recall what they learned and to be able to say it really helps them solidify that learning. And when you spend the last five minutes sharing answers, those who didn't quite get it right can now correct their answers, gives them an opportunity to do so. You're going to raise the success percentage of your classroom quite a bit by having this kind of higher level thinking question about the learning and to have it in their notebook and then have a quiz on it where they can open note quiz, they can do it again, you know, sort of thing, or put it on next day's uh, warm-up, same question, where they can just copy it. That's okay. <laughs> just reviewing it again, right? It's a great format, and if you, you know, if they understand, this is the format in this classroom. I, every day I've got an exit pass uh, that I've got, to, I've got to write, and I've got time to write it, and teachers can walk around the room and check my work as I do for doing it right it's, um, I'm motivated to do it because my teacher is my teacher is full of praise I lost something here that was, was on here oh there it is lost that something else no, but, oh there we go my teacher is full of praise for you know that that's just a great format which I recommend trying out it, it, it can work wonders and and by by so there's no right or wrong answer. I mean, there is right or wrong answer, right? But by justifying, I'll understand where the mistake is. Like, what's, why is he making that mistake? When I have to, when he has to justify it. You know, the worst kind of answer for a teacher is, I don't know. The student says, I don't know. And he writes on his paper, I don't know. What do you do about that? Chances are you have one student who does know, Okay? So if you save enough time, you listen to that student does know, you as a teacher, put his answer on the board. Put Shmuley's answer on the board. Okay, put a box around it. Anyone who wrote, I don't know, please copy down Shmuley's answer. Let him copy it down. He's learning. It's helping him. Okay, it's not, it's not ideal. I'd rather he got it already on his own, but he didn't. No harm in him copying down Shmuley's answer. Let him get it. Some kids need it. But... Notice how I put it on the board. He's got to have it visual. 
Chancellor, he doesn't, who knows why he doesn't know? Spaced out, he does know, he doesn't know he knows, he's afraid, who knows? But our goal is that they all get some modicum of success in achieving that objective as much as possible. So, and then when you, then summary is like the last minute, and you guys did a great job. If you can also give them a teaser for tomorrow, you guys did a great job. Tomorrow, we're going to actually learn about how to, what happens when two cars crash into each other. Ooh, sounds good. Okay, that, goodbye. Have a great day. They're going to be excited for tomorrow because you already gave them a teaser about what they're going to happen tomorrow. Right, tomorrow, I have a special surprise for you. Ooh, I don't know what that is. You know, better make sure it's not overblown because then you'll get cynicism. So I put on, that's in your, I have this, I can email you or give you, if you care to use the template, um, I put a sample, did I put this in your book, a sample lesson plan for math? I don't know if I put this in there, but I have one here. Oh, okay. So here's, here's a math one. Can, so, um, let's just do the math ones I have on the board. So, unit study number sense, core learning goal decimals, Decimal will be unit one test. Objective, by the end of this lesson, students will be able to round decimal numbers and to measure length with a metric ruler. Vocabulary, round, metric. Materials, I need to have, make sure I have calculators and rulers, okay? Uh, five minute drill. What are the five order of operations? Questions. What, is that a cue? Uh, I'll give, give them five order of operation questions, meaning five questions that I'll put on the board make them you know, use the, the rules of order of operations to test them on that. And, okay, I decided on this lesson I was gonna, I was gonna assess that with show of hands. A oh, great way to, to assess, it's like this. So, you know, you wanna keep students doing as much as possible. So you get them raising their hands for any good reason. It's very a good idea. Hold up one finger if you say yes, two fingers if you say no. Instead of just asking them, one, don't put, See, if I ask you what you think the answer is, 20 kids over there are off task because I'm only giving you attention. What about the other 25 kids? I want to ask as many kids as possible. So instead of asking one student what the answer is, ask them all. I want you to hold up one finger if you say positive and two fingers if you say negative. That means they're all doing the answer. And they can look around at each other. They're involved rather than just pick on one student. Does that make sense? And then... I can say, and, and zero if you don't know, right, zero. But everyone has to vote. You can't, no one's not going to raise their hand. And you're going to praise them for raising their hand, and if someone's not raising their hand, say, why did you raise your hand, right? You can do the same thing with, um, with uh, at the end of the class, you can say, five is, if five is, if, if 10 means fantastic and zero means terrible, show many, show many, how many fingers, to what level did you achieve today's objective? If you got 100%, give me 10 fingers. If you got zero, give me zero fingers. Everyone take a vote, right? And most of them are going to raise five to 10 fingers. And you say, you guys did a great job. Have a great day. Here's another way of ending the class where they're involved in self-assessment and showing that they feel they learned something. And so it also gives you some very powerful feedback. If you see not a lot of fingers going up, you might wonder, are they playing with me or is there something really missing here that I need to think about? Okay, it's a great way to do it. Just have the show of hands. So you can do that here, um, the excessive drill, show of hands, right? I, I can give them the answers and, and uh, say, f one finger if you found that easy, two fingers if you found it a little hard, three fingers if you found it really hard, something like that. Um, here I said 15 minutes review. Oh, okay, that, I had to review a procedure that day. I felt like there was a procedure that was not being well done, and I needed to go over the procedure again. So I decided to repractice with them this whole procedure. This was sixth grade math I was teaching this year. I needed to review that procedure. 15 minutes might have been too much, but we then included last night's homework because uh, I was told I had to give homework. It's a public school. I didn't want to give homework. I was told I had to. And now the motivation was the pizza problem. I figured pizza problem, you know, kids like pizza, so... How do you get the, how do you turn a pizza problem into motivation? You know what you do? Raise your hand if you like pizza. <laughs> I do too. Unfortunately, I can't serve you pizza today. I'm not allowed to. But 
we have a pizza problem for you. I just got you motivated a little bit, maybe a little bit. And they turn to the page and so on. This is just an example of a lesson plan. It's page two. I walk them through it. Worksheet, oh, they had a worksheet that day. Summary, review the steps, uh, and homework. So this is a lot. I think this is, uh, I think this was probably maybe too much for one lesson, but that, that was that lesson. I didn't modify it. That's what I did back in 2003. Okay. Um, any thoughts or questions about points, comments, criticisms about lesson planning? My goal in this little presentation was to motivate you to write some kind of lesson plan every day. Can I just see a show of hands for my own sake? Uh, five means I'm highly motivated to write a lesson plan every day, and one means I'm very unmotivated to write a lesson plan every day, of some kind. Not necessarily my, this format, of some sort. Go ahead, be honest. What did you get, two? Okay, three, okay. What did you start out as? Um, I should have asked you before, uh, also. <laughs> probably before I did it Okay, I got you a little increased. Okay. You'll find, the, 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 I want to go back to review why I think lesson planning is vital of some sort, is back to the, the, the core reason, the motivation that should be, is that I really very much believe that 10 to 15 minutes of assessment and helping them see, uh, sh show you what they learn and show themselves what they learn is vital to them feeling successful as students and really solidifying it. And without some kind of plan, I, I very well may not achieve that every day. And that's why some level of plan is, I think, vital. Even if it's not as formalized as the one that I gave you, but some structure. You know, they give you these planning books and for teachers, and each day has like this little box, okay? So even if in that little box you write, okay, today's objective, and today's warm-up, and today's vocab, and today's lesson, and you know, and even if you put it in there, even if that's your entire lesson plan, this little tiny box, that's definitely better than walking in, winging it, okay? I've got some concept of what I'm going to do today is far better than just walking in. To that point, and... Uh, sort of a side point, but I want to remind everybody, uh, I know most of you are, don't have to be told this, but when a teacher walks in late after the students, it destroys a class. It, it, shows, uh, that, it, it shows that I don't care about you that much. You may not be true. It's just this is what they think. This is what they feel. I don't care about it. Someone else is more important than you. Someone else is more important than this class. I'm disorganized. I'm not so professional. Us being on time and starting class on time, without exception. As an observer last year, I was observing several classrooms, and I saw this often happen, where I'd be in there sitting waiting, and the teacher is, students are rocking in, and the teacher is maybe putting around here, setting stuff up, and he's there, but he hasn't started class yet because he's still writing on the board, or he's getting out the projector, and it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to do. And you're, it's not your classroom. You have to walk in there and get set up. It's not easy. It's really hard. Uh, if possible, uh, this one classroom issue where the teacher really could not get in there early. So I, I, I went to bat for him, and I got permission for him to go in there before the previous class to write his objective and warm up on, the, on one part of the board and leave it there. So in advance, so at least it was there when he walked in, because he really didn't have time. He had three minutes just like the students did. He walked in and he had three minutes just to get everything ready. That was impossible. How can you teach that way? It's hard. I'm not saying it's easy, but when we're folk on the ball, it could be that you could have all this on a slide and shine it on the screen, you know, if that's, if you're, if you're well organized, if you have a projector available. There's different ways of doing it. But it ain't easy. But it, starting on time, the other thing that's a, t a terrible, terrible um, thing to uh, the, your appearance of professionalism is whenever this, you pull this out, 
I, I can't tell you. <laughs> it's hard for me to believe it happened, but there are teachers who will make a phone call or t take a phone call in class or check their messages. Or I, or I was told by one of my children they had a teacher who actually ordered food, his lunch, in class on his phone. Now, that might seem cute to you. It ain't cute. It, it destroys your appearance of professionalism. Whenever your phone rings, if it rings because you forgot to the ringer off, so you turn the ringer off and say, sorry about that. But it's just a terrible thing to have a phone out in a classroom. It, does, it doesn't turn the ringer off, put it away, leave it in the car, whatever. Um, it's, it's, the students don't respect that. You know, go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. Or, or, or spending too much time on show and tell that's irrelevant to the subject. Like a teacher who's teaching history and brings in his camera. Cool, he's got this cool camera. He thinks the students will be interested in it, which is fine. Then he spends a half hour showing them the camera. Students actually don't respect that. They think it's goofy and a waste of time, even though they'll egg you on because that's their job is to do whatever they can to get you to stop teaching, right? <laughs> but they don't actually want you to. They want you to be, you know, end the show and tell and move on. Unless the show and tell is rel re related to the learning. So that's why I love these nature things because you can relate. I made 120 of these because you can relate these to almost any kind of learning, you know, and then you can, if it get. I also have some, I was talk, I'm going to show this tomorrow. I have some tremendous videos, which I'm going to give you, which are short, and they're almost every topic, and they're great ways. You were worried about not having enough time. I have a series of videos that only come out as, oh, we finished, looks like we achieved today's objective. We have time for a, for a, they're called Smarter Every Day videos. We have time for a Smarter Every Day. Each one's about four minutes long. You guys, we got time for a Smarter Every Day. And then we show the Smarter Every Day video. You know, that, that's one way. I have a lot of these. I've got um, optical illusions, a whole folder of them I'm going to give to you. You can just shine optical illusion on the screen and say, who can figure it out? You know? Yeah, lots of these things to fill up time in a meaningful way. They're not just simply wasting time. So don't worry about having extra time at the end. Do worry about having, trying to do too much in that period. Because it worse, I think it's worse to not achieve something than to achieve it too early, in my opinion. Yeah? Comments? Does your school that you teach at have offer have a place for teachers, faculty to get coffee? Cafe lunchroom or anything like that? I don't know about that one. I don't think they do. If they do, it's a great task for a student who needs to give it, give him a job. Will you please go get me a cup of coffee? It's a great job. Anything, remember, you, that's true. That's true. No, it can't be teacher's lounge. Yeah, like Nair Israel has a common coffee area for teachers and students. Everybody can get it. So you can say to a stu student who needs, who's got ants in his pants, you can say, would you please go get me a cup of coffee? No sugar or whatever, you know? And he feels good. He can leave class, his permission. He's doing something useful. He comes back five minutes later with a coffee for you, right? Things like that, I think, are great if you can find jobs for students who need jobs that are quick, that are clear. We take this office for me, please, you know, etc. Don't ask them to make copies for you. I don't think I'd do that. Mm -hmm.